we descend further and further into the nightmare, through the maze-like streets of a fake world. Although perhaps I have it all wrong. Perhaps this world is more real than the world I live. This world of floating demons, of children in pain. Damn Chigidiel. Damn him and his use of these innocent souls as fuel. Food. Poor Bjorn. I can't even begin to imagine what he's going through now. Still, even as I lose myself, there is one thing I am certain of. We need to stop this thing. Or at least do our best. My power seems to be growing stronger, at least. I feel without it we will be lost to these horrors we now face. Yet, I wonder how much more I can take. How much longer will I be able to tell the difference between this world and the others? Maybe. Maybe I already can't tell anymore. This is Red Moon Roleplay. The colors and the shapes are all wrong, twisted. You're bombarded with feelings, with sounds, with impressions. They're all like memories you have forgotten and find yourself unable to grasp. You're floating in space, and there is a twisting vortex ahead of you, like a maelstrom. You are reached by the insight that you could annihilate yourself there. Your identity would be no more. Your mind could become mere fragments. No more pain, no more suffering. Fuck the world. Fuck the worms and the boils. Fuck all of this. Just a blissful insanity. A mind unable to comprehend anything anymore. How does that sound to you? It sounds like a load of bullshit. And I try and fight against this feeling, and I, in this, wherever we are, is Bjorn here? Bjorn! I just try and call out if I can. Bjorn! Bjorn, yes, you are here, right by Carver. How does this proposition sound to you? I flail about, floating free, and the colors and these sounds, and at the same time just feeling, oh... How would it be to get rid of it all? But I can't. Not now. Not 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 when I've just seen a picture of my daughter suffering. I I can't let go now. Not with her, and not with having met Vova again. It's things that have made it too real. Some years ago, maybe I would have let it go, but with recent events tying up the people that are really important to me, I I can't. I can't let it go. No, as blissful as it might be, it, it is not for you. And you are back in the labyrinth again. It's the catacombs underneath Paris. The stench of blood and rot have intensified, and the black smoke is truly suffocating down here. I take a moment to gather myself. What even just happened? Like, I'm thinking to myself, was that a result of... Did I pull too hard on the fabric here? I remember the whole reason I tried that was because of my experiences before, where all the rituals seem so much more powerful on this side of the veil. But was that my fault? What do I think? Yes, you pulled at forces in here that were truly, truly, truly powerful. And... Something tells you that wherever you were is not just the center of this labyrinth. It is the center of all dreams. It is where all dreams come from. It is the vortex. 
Bjorn, are you alright, Bjorn? Yeah, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. That was, uh, did you do that? Possibly. I, uh, that was a little bit of, um, ad-libbing there. Uh, I, I touch my injured hand at this point, like, ah, sorry, but you have to believe me that we needed them out of the way. And don't get me wrong, we haven't dealt with them. They're just gone for now. They'll be back. We need to move quickly, and next time, be ready for them. Uh, but sorry I didn't have time to share the plan with you. <laughs> Can't we fight them somehow? We'll need better weapons than we had right then, which at the time was a pipe. Uh, we'll need more than that. For now, I've got rid of them at least. Let's keep going. We need to find this guy and get out of here. Yeah, right. The catacombs. Parisian catacombs. Is this another hint? There are children here as well in cells all throughout the catacombs. You see them. They hardly look human anymore. Tortured beyond recognition. And they too are grown together with their cells. I walk by and I, I look at them. So what's this supposed to mean? More prisoners. But they said we could free them. But it must be something key later on. It's not, you know, them. if there's a way to free all of them, it has to be something like... I know this will sound ridiculous, but thinking metaphysically here, like maybe some sort of host or switch or item or something that can release them all, because otherwise releasing them all individually would take forever. I don't understand that. We couldn't do that quickly. Maybe the incarnates, maybe there lies the key. Remember they said that this was the realm of one of them, so maybe this isn't Chickadee L's realm himself, but just the incarnates' realm, maybe. It looks like they're sort of stuck just just like the other children or Nika they were stuck to the floor this they've grown together with the place so there's probably yeah 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 there's probably something here binding them something that perhaps needs to needs to be destroyed think of a hive maybe that's how it works he isn't killing them after all he feeds on them to feed on them they need to live for a while at least Maybe this is all just a massive feeding den. Ugh. From which he, he takes his power, yeah. And do you think the incarnate has the, 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 the key? I mean, he is the one holding them here. A linchpin. Maybe if we can disrupt him, we can bring back that power I felt before and break this place. But let's keep going for now. What if we open all these uh, these bars, these cages? What if we get them open, uh, and maybe when, when once the power loosens, they can run for themselves? You're thinking of the bars too metaphysically, Bjorn. It doesn't matter if there's bars or not. It's 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 the whole place is the trap. If the whole place is weakened, then yes, they might be able to escape. Huh. Okay. So yeah, it, it, that wouldn't make a difference then. All right. I start leading him on. I find it interesting because if these are like the Parisian catacombs, I will have totally read a few books about them. Not many, but in my uh, studies, the Parisian catacombs, of course, come up a few times as an interesting location, not only for old-fashioned occultism, but just history as well. There's something exciting about being in, in that place, but, well, you wish it was under other circumstances. The children, there are fewer and fewer of them as you move forward until there's only empty cells. Carver, you're approaching the roaring abyss at the labyrinth's heart. The air becomes colder and darker and you're filled with an intense feeling of imminent disaster. Bjorn, the calling from the doll, grow stronger with every step. You are close now. I reach down into my pocket and I uh, I hold it in my hand now. Yes, it feels so good to hold it. Finally, you reach a long, wide corridor. Ornament pillars of black steel rise toward the ceiling, hidden in the darkness far above you. 
and the floor gratings rattle metallically below your feet. The pillars twist slowly. When you look closely, you can see that they are alive, an amalgam of people and steel melded together. At the end of this corridor, there is a pit-like cell, a single cell. That is where you must go, Bjorn. So is there a, a stair down then? Yes. I nod towards it and I start moving down. I start stepping forwards as well. I take a moment to uh, once again look at my hand that I bit, although the wound is superficial, it still hurts. Yes, it hurts for real. It doesn't hurt like it did in the dreams before, not like when you were beat up by those guards in the camp. This is real pain. In the cell, pressed into its corner, is a is a small boy, maybe three or four years old. He lies against the wall, shaking, curled in a fetal position. You see his face. You recognize him. The boy is Pyotr. Pyotr? What are you doing here? Is this really Pyotr? The Pyotr that you have seen in all of these dreams, he has been different ages. And here he is again. And this is the youngest that you have ever seen him. This is the origin, you think. Um, I guess I feel the doll yearning for him, right? Yes, as it has in the previous dreams. I, uh, I feel it, but I grow hesitant. Cora, are, are we being misled again, or... I can feel the doll, it wants to be with him. Maybe... Give him the doll? You think? On this one occasion... I admit that I don't see Chickadiel's workings. After all, the doll seems to give him comfort. I'm pretty sure Chickadiel's plans would never involve something that gave a child comfort. So... I, uh, I nod and I grit my teeth for a bit and, uh, well, I go over to the boy and, uh, I hold out my hand with the doll in. He opens his eyes and he grabs it and he roars deafeningly, his face darkening with inhuman rage. The entire labyrinth is shaken by the sound and the walls of the small cell crumble away in clouds of plaster and mortar, blinding you momentarily. When you see clearly again, you find yourself standing in a vast hall, stretching off into infinity. The ceiling can only be glimpsed far above you. Like torches, burning shapes writhe in pain on the floor, casting everything in a flickering sheen. The hall echoes with their tormented wailing. The floor feels alive, pulsating faintly and is completely black, it does not reflect any shadows. Heavy steel beams stained with rust run up to the ceiling and seem to penetrate through the floor. Blood and white-gray fluids run along the beams to be greedily sucked up by the pulsating ground. Pyotr is with you. He's huddling against you, Bjorn. Is he still the small one? Yes, just three or four years old. He speaks and it is the first time you hear him speak. A kind voice, just a little boy. He's coming now. Can you feel it? What, what, what are we supposed to do? He's coming to collect me. Don't let him. I uh, kneel down and I open my arms to, to lift him up. And he appears. A man you have seen on papers and photographs in the clinic 
a man whose face is that of the incarnates. A grotesquely fat man in his forties, dressed in a badly tailored black synthetic suit of East European model with worn out elbows, black hair that hangs in long wisps, an unshaven face. He smiles at you, laughing a bit. <laughs> so you are here. <laughs> all that fight and suffering and all that effort we went through to find you just just to come here. Just to come to me. <laughs> I put uh, Piotr down again. You're not going to get him. I uh, already have what I need from him, but you, after I bend your wills, I will, I will turn you back into children, and then, then I will satisfy myself with your bodies, just as I have with the other children here. Your minds will go away before your body does. I so enjoy that moment when hope is lost. When acceptance simply becomes the only option. It's hopeless for you. Don't you see? I'm God here. And who the fuck are you? Well, who are we indeed? God here, eh? So this is your little slice of hell, rather than just Chigidiel's slice of hell. I am Chigidiel, and Chigidiel is me, and you will soon cease to be. I don't think so, and I feel like, ah, uh, no, I, I gotta get through this for the people that I love, yeah. I look at Cover like, what do we do, and I, I wanna just run up and punch him. I will burn my final six cents as I have a moment, just a moment of doubt because even I'm a little unsure. What the fuck do we do now? We're here. And I just sort of try and think of Jenkins. I just think, what? What can we do? Carver, in this place, you can die, but so can he. You have the power to create weapons. You have the power to change this reality. Change it and destroy him. Change it and save the children. I sort of take another step back. And I try and keep calm for the moment. And I feel... Yes, I suppose there is nothing we can do. No harm in chatting a little more, eh? Only you here. Where are your buddies, your friends? Do they all have their own little hell slices all over the place? And what even are you doing? I mean, surely there's no harm in telling us a little. You're about to end us, after all. He seems somewhat irritated by this reaction. Bjorn, especially you, you expressed that you had to get through this to to get to those that you love. You are doing this for love. You have not let hate take you over. This is not what he was prepared for. You see him be noticeably irritated by that and by your carver, your your wish to, to talk to him. You should want to kill him. You should want to just... Destroy him with all your might. But that is not who you are. And that makes him weaker. You will have plus one on all your rolls. Hmm. And I kind of feel like I'd feel this. And I sort of add on to that question, noticing as an answer like, What? You don't do discourse? You don't do logic? Ah, that's interesting, isn't it? Long chains appear in his arms. He starts spinning them around. They must be four meters long, at least. The air vibrates as they spin around him. Although, something tells me you're not going to talk much more. Bjorn, just note that. Try and focus. Focus. Uh, don't hate. Just be just. Uh, and then I try and see what I can make out of the situation. Um, three options. Right. Once again, 
I imagine the images I had before, the images of classical good, the archangels, the heavenly forces, and I just focus on Bjorn, and I just imagine him not as, you know, Bjorn carrying a child, but as a massive, flaming angel of justice, his very arm, a sort of sword forged of fire and retribution, and I just burn one whole thing, imagining him as this. And that is what you become, Bjorn. You become an avenging angel, and your body is a weapon. What do you do? I look to uh, the incarnate, and I just go, I think your chains weigh you down, God. And I just imagine the chains he's swinging around so confidently suddenly actually being chained, stuck in the ground, and like his arms covered in the chains, like, you know, like the other chains have now become sort of are chaining him down rather than being swung freely. That's my final thing. As I, by the way, as I'm doing this, take lots of steps back, <laughs> letting Bjorn take center stage. You do that, or rather you try to do that, but they do not change. <laughs> he just uh, laughs a little bit. <laughs> I told you I was God here, remember? I feel pity for you, demon. I feel sorry that you wouldn't be able to get peace. And I go for him. You go to attack. You engage in combat then. How do you engage? Well, I try then to go, yeah, for the chains, to shatter one of the chains. I roll 14 for lightning fast. And uh, 18 in engaging combat. You're able to get one of the uh, chains out of his uh, hands and you're able to come in and strike at him. Yes, and I try to hit his weak spot. You cut open his big belly and it reveals rotting intestines inside of there. And he screams... And he attacks at you with his uh, chain. I use my second lightning fast edge to avoid an attack. And the chain just passes right over your head. And he's roaring and the, uh, the chain is just flying through the air. And he tells you something. He speaks. Kill your friend. Make him suffer for me. Roll to keep it together. Fifteen. You feel how he's trying to control your mind. He does not succeed. What do you do? I leap high into the air with a blade raised and I try crashing down on him with the next, next attack. Seventeen. You strike at him again, cutting up uh, his body further. He goes into an uncontrollable rage. The entire area just start to shake. Parts of the floor are starting to explode, uh, leaving a hole down to the abyss below. I need you to now roll to avoid harm, to uh, avoid being drawn down into this abyss. 13 with a plus one. 13. What about uh, Carver? The uh, spectacle of this battle is a bit immense for me. Even in a dream, I'm just sort of standing back, letting it unfold. I'm not a fighter. Uh, but then, obviously, I see these cracks and holes appearing, and I just sort of go like, oh, fuck. And uh, that's a five. You lose uh, your footing, and you feel yourself starting to fall, but you're able to just grasp on to whatever's remaining of this floor, and you find yourself sort of hanging freely uh, in one hand. Bjorn, you see this, what do you do? We need to end him, we can't let him get away. I shout, hold on, Carver! As I go to attack him again. I scream out, it's fine, Bjorn! Just kill him! Uh, Ten. You deal another great blow to, to this incarnate, cutting it up further. A blood splatters everywhere, but he's still moving and he's still swinging his uh, chains around, still sort of smiling through it all, just blood splattered face and these crazy eyes that are staring at you. And you are subjected to a counter attack. 
you need to avoid harm as he swings out with the chain to attack not just you, but also Carver. Fifteen. You are able to avoid it, but Carver, there is no way for you to avoid it. The chain hits your hand, and Bjorn, you now have a choice. Carver is going to fall to his death if you do not save him. Or you can kill the incarnate. I'll have no time to to make a decision here, I think, so I, I'm just going to fling myself to for Carver to try and save him. Yes, Carver, and just as you're about to fall, an angel reaches out to to grab your hand and catches you in the last moment as you're about to plummet to your death. Come on, Carver, <sighs> get up, get up. Right, just, just... And you do that, but Bjorn... Sometimes selfless acts come with a cost. He is right on top of you now. You feel the chain around your uh, neck. I want you to endure an injury with harm six. Twelve. You're able to get Carver up and you're able to sort of shake off the incarnate. You're able to get his chains off you, but you're sort of thrown off balance, and you find yourself lying there on the ground trying to catch your breath. And, Carver, that is when you see someone, a young man wearing a Soviet military uniform. Several scars create an irregular pattern on his brow, while his right ear is misshapen. He is younger than when you met him, but that is Yuri Chazov. He nods to you, but his hands are empty and he is unarmed. Ah, uh, I kind of have a moment of thinking, fucking hell, he was here. I forgot. So I kind of roll along the floor a bit, like, ah, like, completely disheveled, blood covered. And I just look at him and I just go, fuck, fuck, fuck. Uh, unfortunately, my art of dreaming today was only a six. I do get to choose one option. So, all right, so in my desperation, I just sort of fling, and just the idea of him having a gun. Just a gun. Gun! Ah! Yes, and in Yuri Shazov's hands appear a Russian PPSH, one of these large submachine guns from World War II, and he sees it, holds it seemingly very comfortable with it, And he starts running towards the Incarnate. The Incarnate is swinging his chains against him. You see how it hits him and slashes off his left arm. He screams with uh, pain, but he is seemingly unbothered. He has not embraced love, you can see. He kicks the Incarnate and jumps on top of him with the weapon and yells, This is for Boris! And he fires the full magazine into the Incarnate's face. Blood splatters everywhere. The Incarnate picks Yuri up and rips him in two pieces, throwing both of them into the Uh. abyss. But he is staggered, Uh. and he is weak. He is bleeding profusely. I want to get up off the floor. I'm heaving myself up, and I'm trying to get my feet steady so I can lunge for the Incarnate now while he's still staggered. You have the chance here to, to end him. And I raise the giant blade that is my arm, and I launch for a straight, straight fo- towards him. Yeah. Yes. Roll to engage in combat. I close my eyes, just sort of like I can't watch. Fifteen. You see how your blade penetrates from from the neck and down, uh, slashing sort of di- diagonally across the body, cutting a deep, deep cut into him. No one could survive this. Spits up blood and lies there shaking. And I twist it as it's still there in him. Yes. He stops moving. This is for... for the children. For everyone. For us. And I stagger back. You have Carver lying on the ground and you... uh, see Pyotr hiding behind one of the pillars looking out 
and you see that one half of Yuri Shazov did not end up in the abyss. It's lying right by the edge. He is still alive. I, uh, I go over. I run over to him. Yuri, we did it. You helped us. You did it. Boris, I found him at last. He's resting now. I think I will join him. Maybe we can go fishing again. And Chazov breathes his last breath. And I uh, fall down on my knees next to him. And I look around and I say, Yeah, he must have been in here somewhere too. And I... uh, and I hold my hand towards Pyotr for him to come over. Are you alright? Thank you. Thank you. He then looks beyond you with eyes filled with fear, pointing towards where the incarnate fell. I look there, turn my head over. He has risen. And he raises his hand, and the room starts swirling around you. Reality changes. And you are children. You are sitting in a doctor's office. Carver, you are you. And Bjorn, you are his sister. Twins. The doctor that is speaking to you lacks a face. It's just smooth skin and a mouth that speaks. He's speaking Romanian, but you understand exactly what he's saying. I'll just get right to the point. Your parents are dead. Your father murdered your mother. It's funny, actually. He cut your mother's head off, cut off all the other extremities, and then he drained her of blood. Let me show you. He turns off the light and turns on a slideshow with autopsy pictures. Okay, let's see here. The best part was uh, what he did with her spleen and her kidneys. Oh, that slide is here. I get giddy just looking at an artist at work. Anyway, all that is over now. No more mommy and daddy. That's fun, right? You can play as much as you want now. Go, have fun. He points towards the door. Uh, I... Don't. I am just sort of staring, and I've completely the the sudden change and looking at Bjorn, who looks like my sister. I I just I'm completely lost, and I just a little child's voice. I'm like, I don't understand. Why? Where? Are, who are you, Carver? And I hear my voice. It's a little girl's voice, and I look down, and I feel my hair and my face. You'd, well, at this stage look like me now, with the blonde hair and... But a girl. My eye colour, yeah. Cora, it's me, Bjorn. Jen, no, it's fine, Jen, it's alright. I'll, I'll take care of it. I, I get up and I go, Sir, why, who are you, sir? He's uh, turned on the, the slideshow again, and he's looking at these autopsy pictures. Grotesque, just disemboweled bodies and just carcasses. He's sitting there, like, just laughing and, and looking at it and pointing and, and pointing things out to you, but he doesn't seem to pay any mind to you at all or listening to what you have to say. I jump off the chair, and I, and I hold out my ha- arm towards Carver. Carver, we should go. Uh, We're not supposed no, to be here. Yeah, no, we need to... I, I start staring at the pictures, and I'm thinking, like, are they? Because surely the people in the the bodies aren't my parents, because my parents... <coughs> I know how my parents died. They didn't die like that, Jen. They didn't die like that, Jen. You know that. They, they, I, they didn't die like that. Jen? Who's Jen? You're Jen. Jen. We... Shh. I should start looking at the pictures. Yes, it is pictures of... of a woman. There is a resemblance. But the body is 
very badly cut up. You're not sure. It's supposed to be your parents. You're supposed to be your mother. And a father who'd committed suicide. It's a bit much to take in. A doctor without a face is just sitting there, staring at them and laughing. I go to the door he told us to go out. I open it. I, I just say to Jen, it's not right. There's, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Carver, I'm not Jen. Uh, it's me, Bjorn. I just... I'm not... It's me. Uh, I'm unsure at this point I remember who Bjorn is. Do I? It's starting to melt together in a weird way, but no. Yes. Yes, yes, you, you know who Bjorn is. You, you know that this is... This is... No. This is the past, but it's not the past, right? You have no memories of this? No, I don't. What's outside the door? It's what looks like a daycare facility. An orphanage, perhaps? There's a group of faceless children out there in the play area. They're kicking another child who is down. Carver, they all have the face of you and your sister. Everybody the same face. Mm. Even the child that's being kicked. Mm. I, I go and I sort of just grab Jennifer's hand. And I just start saying, No, they're... they're why do they all... You're the only sister I have, Jen. Who are these children? Who are these children, Jen? Somebody is at the door. It's a glass door. You can see silhouettes behind the door, Carver. They look... They look like your mother and father. The ones you know. It's blurry. Uh, uh, I, I kind of tug on Jen to the door like, Look, look, Bjorn, Jen. Bjorn, Jen. Look to the, the door. And I sort of start tugging to the door. I want to go to the door. That seems familiar. That seems correct. <laughs> The incarnate appears before the door. He seems very weak, his body all cut up. He smiles. I will never let you leave here. I can stay alive in here. I can control this limited space. I can control you. I can feed on your suffering. That will be enough. Carver, Carver, I, 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 I yank at him to turn towards me. Look. He he feeds on us feeling bad. Look how much we did together. Look how far we've come. We've done great, Carver. We're a good team. You think so? Yeah. You never said that before, Jen. You've always been mad at me. I don't know why. And I stopped for a bit at him calling me Jen again, and I just... Fine. James... Yes, James. I love you, James. And I hug him. I go to hug him. Uh, And I feel a weird moment. Because suddenly a little part of me goes... I don't deserve that. I haven't done anything to deserve it. She wouldn't have forgiven me. But she's not here. I'm not here. Kind of... Lean into the hug a bit. I kind of say, I wish I deserved that. Bjorn, Bjorn, and I kind of look to the thing and go, You feed, you feed on my suffering. Yes, you do feed on my suffering, don't you? You feed on my suffering. And I just then imagine, and I try it again, affect this dream I'm now in. 17. So I'll imagine then just my hand, my little child's hand, just turning into the smallest, well not really small, but just like suddenly a jagged sort of dagger-like weapon. And I just sort of imagine the permanence of it. And I just look at him and I just slowly, very slowly walk over to him and go, you won't feed on anyone's suffering anymore. And I just sort of very serenely almost just insert my bladed hand right into his eye socket yes and you do that and it just passes in there and 
and he stares at you and he falls to the ground. You're standing in front of the door now. You see the silhouettes at the door. They're waiting. Seeing him fall to the ground, I just go to the door and fling it open. He open the door. It's them. It's, it's really them. They hug you. You feel their warmth. It feels real. You hug them for what feels like... like an eternity. Your father looks at you and smiles. You can see both him and your mother crying. James, it's great to see you this last time. We will always love you, son. We can't help you in the hardships that you're facing. But remember our love. We always loved you and your sister. You you are our children in every way that matters. Our love for you was real. Remember us. We can be your courage. We can be your strength. We forgive you, James. And at that bit, I just suddenly, I can't help, I start weeping a little and I go, You forgive me, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it. And they just hug you and comfort you. And you can uh, recover three stability and an additional plus one for thirst of knowledge. Uh... <laughs> I kind of just, as a child, start to weep, uh, and I just feel confusion, but I suppose a sense of serenity, in a way, uh, and I become a little more stable as I just quietly just say, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I know it was my fault. I know it was my fault. There's a car waiting for you outside. It's a hackney carriage. A London taxi. Shall we go? They ask. Wait. I don't understand still. Who are these other children? You look back into the facility and there's no one there anymore. It is empty. It is all starting to fade away. Gradually, bit by bit, this dream is collapsing. The incarnate is gone now. All that remains is the door, your parents, and the, and the taxi. What about Bjorn? He is there as well, as Jen. And I just st stood there and I watched... And I realize I'm sort of strangely a part of this familiar memory or dream or whatever it is. And I walk over to them and I don't say anything more. I just play along because I realize this. I try to just be whatever he wants me to be at this point. As I have done with so many other people in their lives, I guess. And you do so. You do so successfully. As I go to the car, then, I start to let them lead us to the car. I kind of... Am I still a child? Maybe I'm starting to grow up now. I'm not sure. Maybe I don't really pay attention. I just look to Mother for a moment, and I just say... Did... Jennifer know as well? No. She didn't know. She still doesn't know. How could we forget? She just shakes her head. I just get into the car. The driver's face is obscured. Where to? He asks. Home. Yeah. I hear Berlin is nice this time of year. 
Hmm, wait, my adult mind starts to surface a bit more. I go, hang on a minute. You, you recommend Berlin, do you? Not not Paris or, or New York? No. Definitely Berlin. I guess we're going to Berlin. Bjorn? Do you actually call me that now? Yes. Yeah. I guess we're going to Berlin. Certainly, the driver says, the doors are closed, and before everything becomes black, you see his face. He has a solid eagle nose, and he has the face of Pyotr. He holds up the doll, and he smiles at you. And everything becomes dark. It's morning. You wake up. It's the Schlosspark Hotel in Berlin, Björn. The doll is gone. Pyotr is dead now, finally at peace. He died last night in the clinic. And Ethel and Lila, they are no longer bothered by nightmares. You don't know how you know this, but you know it is true. You feel rested. As if you have slept again, unbothered by the nightmares. And finally, the master of your dreams. You can recover to stability. One thing is on your mind, however. You have a number. A number that you're not supposed to call. It's a number to her, to your daughter. You have it memorized. I sit up in my on the side of the bed I look out the window for a bit I just wow I look down on my arms the markings you look out into the sunshine it feels warm and nice but the boils the boils are still there tingling and moving inside more and more of them soon they will devour you and there will be nothing left. I try to focus on the number, then. The number that I'm not supposed to call. But then again, now I'm in a hotel where hopefully no one knows I am and who I am and what I'm doing. Um, is there a phone in the room? There is. I go to pick it up, to pick up and uh, dial a number, a number to my wife and daughter in Sweden. You dial the number. Someone picks up. It's a female voice. Hello. Hello. Um, Anna, is is that you? Uh, no, it's Nika. <sighs> Papa? Yeah. Yeah, it's me. You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we play the campaign The Black Madonna for the tabletop roleplaying game Cult Divinity Lost. The Black Madonna was originally constructed by Gunilla Jonsson and Mikael Petersen in 1991, with additional material for the 2017 edition by Marco Perman, Matthias Fredriksson, Petter Nallo and Robin Lillianberg. Cult Divinity Lost is published by Helmgast. The music was created by Atrium Carceri and is used with permission from their label Cryochamber. Visit cryochamber.bandcam.com or their YouTube channel to hear more excellent dark ambient. A new episode of Red Moon Roleplaying is released every Friday. Please like our Facebook page and give us comments, input and feedback there. You can also visit us at redmoonroleplaying.com. Finally, a big thank you to all supporters. If you want to show your appreciation and encourage our work, 
look out for us on Patreon and see if you want to support the show there. While the show will always be free of charge to our listeners, Patreon supporters will have access to extra material, such as a bonus podcast where we answer your questions about the campaign and role-playing games in general. If you just can't wait, you can even get access to the full-length, raw and unedited versions of our gaming sessions way before they are released as finished episodes. Thanks for listening. Looking forward to meeting again next week.